from Microbe TV. This is Infectious Disease Puscast, episode 36, recorded on August 30th, 2023. I'm Daniel Griffin, and welcome to another Puscast. References, as always, are available in our show notes at microbe.tv, the home of our growing multimedia empire. Now, PUSCAST is a review of the infectious disease literature for the last two weeks that we found interesting or entertaining. And now on to the literature, shall we? We will start with viral and uh, remember to listen to TWIV, uh, uh, the clinical updates. And, and I, um, I dare to say that the uh, deep dives are returning to the original deep nerdy quality that uh, had endeared them to me initially. So uh, make sure to check those out. The article, Detection of Rotavirus in Respiratory Specimens from Bangladeshi Children Aged Under Two Years Hospitalized for Acute Gastroenteritis, was published in JID. In this investigation, the authors systematically assessed if rotavirus RNA is detectable by RT-PCR from nasal and oropharyngeal swabs of Bangladeshi children with acute rotavirus gastroenteritis. Now, forehead swabs were also collected to assess skin contamination among 399 children aged less than two years hospitalized for gastroenteritis uh, during the peak rotavirus season. Uh, rotavirus RNA was detected in stool oral, nasal, and forehead swab specimens of 89%. Uh, subset were genotyped, and genotype was concordant with a child specimen, um, and several different genotypes were detected across children. Um, interesting, uh, but where they are going with this is uh, not just rotavirus is everywhere, but is this a potential route of transmission? Um, still looks like a little bit more investigation required. All right, Bell's palsy and COVID. The article, Risk of Bell's Palsy Following SARS-CoV-2 Infection, a nationwide cohort study was published in CMI. Well, I think I should probably point out as background, right? This was raised as a signal, um, you know, potential Bell's palsy associated with the vaccines. And though we do see Bell's palsy after vaccines, we don't necessarily see it increased or more frequently after vaccines. But what about actually getting COVID? Well, this study um, looked at a population, nationwide population-based study derived from all the South Korean population, okay, including 11,593,365 and 36,000, 36, no, million, 565,099 participants with and without COVID-19, respectively. So uh, about 11.5 and 36.5 million participants with and without COVID-19, respectively. The uh, regression model was the fine and graze regression model was utilized to calculate the adjusted subdistribution, the adjusted hazard ratio, uh, considering death as a competing risk to assess the association between SARS-CoV-2 infection and the risk of Bell's palsy. All participants were followed up from December 1, 2021 until incident Bell's palsy, SARS-CoV-2 infection, death, or March 31st, 2022. Um, subgroup analyses were conducted based upon a participant's vaccination status, so completion of primary series versus unvaccinated. And what did they find? Uh, they found that COVID-19 was associated with increased risk of Bell's palsy in all participants. Um, it was an adjusted uh, hazard ratio of 1.24, so about 24% higher. However, the size of the COVID-19-related Bell's palsy risk was significantly lower among those who completed the primary series of the COVID-19 vaccine compared to those who were unvaccinated. Um, the unvaccinated, the uh, the adjusted hazard ratio is 1.84. The severity of COVID-19 exhibited a gradual escalation in Bell's palsy risk for, for both vaccinated and unvaccinated individuals. So COVID-19 associated with Bell's palsy, uh, being unvaccinated, more of a risk, vaccination is protective, and the more severe your COVID-19, the more significant your risk of ending up with Bell's palsy. 
All right, moving into bacterial. Be sure to listen to this week in microbiology, TWIM. Um, <clears throat> kind of a deep dive on this one here, but I think relevant for a lot of us in clinical practice, the article. There's going to be two here. Executive summary. This is sort of the Cliff's Notes. Executive summary, evaluation and management of diabetes-related foot infections was recently published in CID, along with the full article, evaluation and management of diabetes-related foot infections. Um, now, one of my goals in life is to not see every patient admitted to the hospital be treated with vancomycin and zosin. Uh, this last IDSA diabetic foot infection guideline is archi archived from 2020. 12. I'll leave a link to that. Um, so important not to be practicing medicine based on uh, recommendations from more than a decade ago, because as the authors point out, proper evidence-based and multidisciplinary teams can reduce major consequences such as above ankle amputations. So the recommendations are uh, well summarized uh, in the executive summary in a table one. Um, the to-do list in the executive summary, um, one, surgical debridement if present, drain deep purulence and excise necrotic tissue, right, site control, um, assess risk of amputation using clinically validated criteria. Don't just sort of wing it. Um, and if this is elevated, uh, get the surgeons involved and participate in risk benefit share decision making. Peripheral artery disease, obtain relevant vascular studies. Uh, request vascular surgery evaluation if the patient is likely to benefit from revascularization. Um, you know, again, using the validated uh, classification that we'll talk a bit about. And yes, antibiotics. Once patient is stabilized and has uh, responded to initial antimicrobial therapy, select an appropriate oral or IV, definitive antimicrobial regimen with considerations including the results of the patient's deep tissue cultures, local epidemiology, antibiogram if cultures are not available, um, discussion about duration appropriate to the degree of infection and the surgical management involved. Um, everything is not the same here. And don't forget about social factors, including the ability to adhere to the regimen. Let's not make recommendations for our patients that will be thwarted due to affordability issues, pill burden, ability to store and administer IV antibiotics, or travel to infusion centers. Um, a bit about offloading, uh, providing the patient with either a non-removable device or a removable device such as a removable surgical boot, um, and wound care. This is a big thing to be able to work with wound care, um, being able to secure longitudinal outpatient follow-up. Um, these people are high risk and they need access to adequate wound care. Um, glycemic control, right? We're talking about our, our diabetics, right? This is the evaluation management of diabetes-related infections. So you want to get that A1C under control. You want to work with your primary care doc and your endocrinologist. Um, and they also address concurrent foot pathology. So if they've got onychomycosis, they've got tinea pedis, um, pedis, offer compressive garments and recommend leg elevation if venous stasis is present, uh, daily moisturizing, uh, dressing areas of dry, cracked skin. This is really a um, multi-specialty approach. Um, you're not only addressing the infection, not only addressing comorbidities, um, but also look at other key issues. Is, is your patient a smoker? Um, does your patient need psychiatry consultation? Um, and look for all those barriers um, to care. Um, one of the things that I'm going to recommend not only reading the executive summary, but also making that deep dive into the evaluation and management of diabetes-related foot infections. Um, and the reason I say that is they actually talk um, quite a bit about um, validated scores. So um, I'm going to quote, the main problem currently is less our lack of full understanding of the problem as our failure to apply what we know works. They point out that concomitant peripheral artery disease is the key most consistently identified risk factor for major amputation and death. Um, and so in this article, they include a summary of the Society for Vascular Surgery's WIFI, Wound Ischemia Foot 
infection classification system for diabetes-related foot infections. So the WIFI um, and in Table 2, they give us a simplified approach to interpreting the Society for Vascular Surgery's um, wound ischemia foot infection classification. And they point out that antibiotic therapy alone, as we keep drilling in here, is not a reasonable strategy. All right. Another article on why it is not only better in terms of patient care, but are you ready for this? A net savings to call the infectious disease consultant. Patients do better and the hospitals save money. The article, Impact of Mandatory Infectious Disease Specialist Approval on Hospital Onset, Costridioides Difficile Infection, C. diff infection rates and testing appropriateness was published in CID. Um, so these are the results of a retrospective study conducted at a single 697-bed academic hospital. Hospital onset C. diff infection rates during three consecutive time periods. There's a baseline. Um, this was 37 months with no decision support. A baseline two, 32 months with computers decision support, and an intervention period 25 months with a mandatory infectious disease specialist approval for all C. diff testing on hospital day four or later. They assess the impact of interventions. Now, during the study period, they evaluated C. diff infections across 331,180 admission and 1,172,015 patient days during the intervention period, a median of one um, C. diff test approval request per day. This ranged from some days none, some days up to six. Um, Adherence by providers with obtaining approval was 85%. So we had a few people somehow squeaking by. They found that an infectious disease-led C. diff testing approval process was not only feasible, but was associated with a greater than 50% decrease in the um, hospital onset C. diff infection rates. All right, the article, Role of Cerebral Imaging on Diagnosis and Management in Patients with Suspected Infective Endocarditis was published in CID. Now, um, is this one practice-changing article? Uh, are we going to start doing uh, cerebral imaging? Well, in terms of background, they start with the mention that cerebral embolic events are common complications of infective endocarditis, and their presence can modify diagnosis and therapeutic plans. Now, the aim of the present study was to assess the role of cerebral imaging on diagnosis and management of patients with suspected infective endocarditis. This study was conducted at the Lausanne University Hospital, Lausanne, Switzerland, from January 2014 to June 2022. The cerebral imaging um, and the infective endocarditis were defined according to modified Duke criteria. Um, so CEE, cerebral embolic events, and the infective endocarditis um, among 573 patients with infective endocarditis suspicion and cerebral image imaging, 42% of patients had neurological symptoms. At least one cerebral embolic event was found in 44% of episodes. Um, based on these finding, episodes were reclassified. Based on the cerebral imaging findings, episodes were reclassified from rejected to possible or from possible to definitive infective endocarditis in 1% and 4% patients, respectively, 0% and 2% in asymptomatic patients, respectively. All right, not big numbers. Among the 330 patients with possible or definitive infective endocarditis, um, at least one um, CEE was found in 57% uh, of the episodes, so CEE being cerebral embolic events. Um, a new surgical indication in association with left-sided vegetation greater than a centimeter was established in 22% of the infective endocarditis patients and 19% of the asymptomatic um, infective endocarditis patients, respectively. So the challenge here is do we image everyone with suspected infective endocarditis, where everyone with suspected infective endocarditis and symptoms, which we probably are already doing, then do we do CTs or MRIs? Um, interesting study, but I'm not sure we've reached practice changing levels. 
All right, the article, Identifying Effective Durations of Antibiotic Therapy for the Treatment of Carbapenem-Resistant Enterobacteriales Bloodstream Infections, a multicenter observational study recently published in CID. So in this cohort of 183 patients with carbapenem-resistant enterobacteriales bacteremia at 24 United States hospitals, patients receiving short courses of active therapy, that's 7 to 10 days, median of 9 days, experienced similar odds of recurrent bacteremia or death within 30 days as those that got almost twice as much, those with prolonged courses of active therapy, 14 to 21 days with a median of 14 days. All right. Well, let us wade right into the controversy with the article, Impact on Clinical Outcomes of Follow-Up Blood Cultures and Risk Factors for Persistent Bacteremia in Patients with Gram-Negative Bloodstream Infections, a systematic review with meta-analysis published in CMI. I know how Mark Chrislip feels about this. Well, the object of this study was to assess the impact on the clinical outcomes of follow-up blood cultures in patients with gram-negative bloodstream infections and to predict risk factors for persistent bacteremia. So here is a meta-analysis where they have stacked the cow pies high. Um, this was performed by pooling odds ratio retrieved from studies providing adjustment for confounders using a random effect model with the inverse variance method. Now, risk factors for persistent bloodstream infections were also assessed. A total of 3,747 articles were screened and 11 observational studies, six assessing impact on outcome with an N of 4,631 and five investigating risk factors for persistent gram-negative um, BSI bloodstream infections conducted between 2002 and 2020 were included. Now, Drum roll, please. Are patients' uh, outcomes better? Is there a lower risk of mortality if we do follow-up blood cultures in, in patients with gram-negative bloodstream infections? Well, the execution of follow-up blood cultures was associated with a significantly lower risk of mortality. Odds ratio 0 0.58. Oh my gosh, 42% reduction in risk of death by getting those repeat blood cultures in gram-negative infections. Can we do even better? Well, the presence of end-stage renal disease, odds ratio 2.99, having a central venous catheter, odds ratio 3.30, infections due to ESBL producing strains, odds ratio 2.25, resistance to empiric treatment, odds ratio 2.70, and unfavorable response at 48 hours emerged as independent risk factors for that persistent bacteremia. So maybe getting repeat blood cultures in gram-negative infections is actually better for our patients. All right. We have the state-of-the-art review, Neurosyphilis, published in CID. Yes, neurosyphilis, rather important. As for 21 years, rates of syphilis have not decreased, but increased in the United States. An important sense I want people to think about, the authors write, current national guidelines recommend CSF examinations to diagnose asymptomatic neurosyphilis in patients with tertiary syphilis and in some patients with serological non-response or serological failure despite a paucity of data demonstrating improved outcomes with CFS examination in these populations. And also, guidelines recommend intensive treatment of asymptomatic neurosyphilis, which may occur during any syphilis stage. And since we have recently seen a number of cases of otic syphilis, syphilis in the ear in our office, I want to also shine some light on, as they mentioned, Ocular syphilis and otic syphilis are considered a subset of neurosyphilis, but the syndromes may not completely overlap and ocular otic manifestations. Um, CSF examinations, however, are not recommended in these patients. For persons who present with ocular and otic signs and symptoms alone, 30% of folks um, may actually have normal CSF parameters. So the patient's got otic or um, eye ocular syphilis, um, then um, we actually go ahead and just treat them for neurosyphilis. All right, the article, Oritavancin compared to the standard of care for treatment of non-endovascular blood, gram-positive bloodstream infections was published in OFID. Um, now, 
This is a retrospective non-randomized trial. So, you know, with that being said, the results did look encouraging. Um, they looked very gram positive for using or rid of Anson. While in the U.S., the only FDA indication um, is to give that 1.2 gram single IV dose um, it does look like at the VA, there's lots of this being used. So uh, comparable outcomes to all the folks that got um, the Ortovancin versus the folks that got vancomycin. So um, obviously, despite the FDA indication only uh, being uh, for uh, the skin infections, uh, it's being used here to, uh, to treat bacteremia. Um, I will point out, according to UpToDate, the pricing in the U.S. for this wonderful option is about $6,000 for that one dose. Now, how expensive is that linazolid with a good RX card and the script called in to the right pharmacy? All right. The next article and a couple more here in bacterial, how we approach suppressive antibiotic therapy following debridement antibiotics and implant retention for a prosthetic joint infection published in CID. Um, too much here to cover in brief. Um, so I do recommend reading this because this is certainly something that comes up in the, um, the practice of infectious disease. Uh, we've got that individual implant retention, prosthetic joint infection. Um, is there evidence for chronic suppressive antibiotics? And as we read here, um, MSSA bad, MRSC worse, um, definitive evidence to support suppressive antibiotics in the right context, and lots of info on what the right context is. All right, and let me not fail to mention the article, the 2023 Duke International Society for Cardiovascular Infectious Disease Criteria for Infective Endocarditis, updating the modified Duke criteria published in CID with, yes, Vance Fowler Jr. as the first and corresponding author. Very dense, so again, a recommended read the next time you get a possible endocarditis patient. I will just uh, read the last line of the abstract that I do think makes sense. These diagnostic criteria should be updated periodically by making the Duke ISCVID criteria available online as a living document. All right, fungal. We got some good stuff in fungal this week. So the article, Adjunctive Diagnostic Studies Completed Following Detection of Candidemia in Children, Secondary Analysis of Observed Practice from a Multi-Center Cohort Study Conducted by the Pediatric Fungal Network, was published in JPID. So one detects candidemia, but what other diagnostic studies might follow? Do we just do everything or targeted investigations? Well, candidemia episodes were included in a secondary analysis of a multi-center comparative effectiveness study that prospectively enrolled patients aged 120 days to 17 years, so little ones, um, with invasive candidiasis, predominantly candidemia, um, from 2014 to 2017. Ophthalmological examination, abdominal imaging, echocardiography, neuroimaging, lumbar puncture um, were performed per clinician discretion. Um, they evaluated the uh, performance and positive results per episode within 30 days from candidemia onset. And here are the results. In 662 pediatric candidemia episodes, 74% underwent abdominal imaging, 68% um, had their eye examined, 64% echocardiogram, 24% neuroimaging, 11% lumbar puncture. Um, performance of each diagnostic study per episode varied across sites by up to 16-fold. Not a lot of uniformity here. Longer durations of candidemia were associated with undergoing ophthalmological examination, abdominal imaging, echocardiogram. Now, immunocompromised status, right, 58% of episodes was associated with undergoing abdominal imaging. Um, it's an adjusted odds ratio of 2.38. Intensive care at candidemia onset was associated with getting that echocardiogram. Um, among evaluated episodes, positive ophthalmological examination was reported in 3% of cases. Did it change management? Abdominal imaging in 6%, echocardiogram in 3%, neurogenic 6%, lumbar puncture 4%. 
All right. The article, Lipid Nanocrystal Amphotericin B for Cryptococcal Meningitis, a randomized clinical trial published in CID, looks rather interesting. So these are the results of a randomized clinical trial that tested oral lipid nanocrystal amphotericin B, sounds exciting, versus IV amphotericin for HIV-associated cryptococcal meningitis in four sequential cohorts. So what are these four cohorts? So they randomized 80 patients to oral um, lipid nanocrystal amphotericin, LNC amphotericin, plus flucytosine, um, 40 of them, and then 40 without two IV loading doses. And then they've got 41 control participants to get IV amphotericin plus um, the flu cytosine. So the 18-week survival was 85% with all oral LNC amphotericin. So 85% survival with oral lipid nanocrystal amphotericin without IV. Um, 90% with the oral LNC amphotericin um, given IV loading doses, and then this compared to 85% with IV amphotericin. Um, you can imagine that the, um, the adverse events were a little bit less frequent with the oral approach um, compared to the IV amphotericin. And the last fungal, the efficacy of 23 commonly used liquid disinfectants against candidemia, candida oris, isolates from the four major clades was published in IC and HE. So how do we clean that room? The bug you just can't get rid of? Well, they isolated um, and tested the effectiveness of 23 disinfectants used in healthcare facilities against isolates from the four major clades of candida oris. Sporocidal disinfectants were consistently effective, whereas quaternary ammonium disinfectants had limited activity, quaternary ammonium alcohol and hydrogen peroxide-based disinfectants varied in effectiveness against C. oris. So we can kill this, but it's the sporocidal disinfectants that are consistently effective in cleaning up after candida oris. All right. And parasitic. We've got some good stuff here uh, for a bit of fun. I recommend the Images in Medicine article from the New England Journal of Medicine, Burrow Ink Test for Scabies. Um, and here they describe a 20-year-old individual with multiple erythematous papules on the trunk and the genital area on the flexor aspect of the wrists. There were no visible skin burrows. However, when a papule on the wrist was covered with a purple skin marker and then wiped with an alcohol swab, an ink-filled skin burrow became visible. So another, another way for us to find those scabies, uh, particularly if we're not using our dermoscopes. A bit disturbing, the article, Evolution of Partial Resistance to Artemisinins in Malaria Parasites in Uganda, was recently published in NEJM. Um, this is a free access or open access article, and here the investigators performed annual surveillance among patients who presented with uncomplicated ma malaria at 10 to 16 sites across Uganda from 2016 through 2022. Um, now, they sequenced the gene encoding Kelch-13 and analyzed relatedness among molecular methods. They assessed malaria metrics longitudinally in eight Uganda districts from 2014 through 2021. Now, by 2021 to 2022, the prevalence of parasites with validated or candidate resistance markers reached more than 20% in 11 of the 16 districts where surveillance was conducted. Um, the identified mutations were seen in far northern Uganda in 2016-2017 and increased and spread thereafter, reaching a combined prevalence of 10 to, in some areas, 54% across much of northern Uganda. Um, the 49F mutation reached a prevalence of 38 to 40 percent in one district in southwestern Uganda. Uh, the 561H mutation previously described in Rwanda was first seen in southwest Uganda in 2021. And are you ready? Already up to 23 percent by 2022. So they have a nice map where you can look at all the different areas where they're um, – they're doing their surveillance, but growing problem with resistance and slower clearance of the parasites. 
All right. Now, this this is an article. I think everyone seems to be reaching out, sending me questions. What's going on? And I found this quite interesting myself. The dispatch human neural larva migrants caused by Ophid ascaris robertsi ascarid published in Emerging Infectious Diseases. So I'm going to I pronounce this basically because I want to bring out the ascaris in there. So the Ophid ascaris species are nematodes, roundworms, exhibiting an indirect lifestyle. So various genera of snakes across the Old and New World are definitive hosts. Uh, these nematodes are native to Australia where the definitive hosts are carpet pythons. I'm trying to figure out if I'm more scared of carpet pythons or this particular parasite, but we'll see in a moment. The adult nematodes inhibit the python's esophagus and stomach and shed their eggs in its feces. The eggs are ingested by various small mammals in which larvae establish, serving as intermediate hosts. How are those intermediate hosts? How are the small mammals going to end up in the pythons? Well, in this case, a 64-year-old woman from southeastern New South Wales, Australia, was admitted to a local hospital in late January 2021 after three weeks of abdominal pain, diarrhea, followed by dry cough and night sweats, noted to have eosinophilia, and a CT scan revealed multifocal pulmonary opacities with surrounding ground glass changes as well as liver and spleen lesions. The BAO revealed 30% eosinophils without evidence of uh, any organisms. Serological testing was negative. Autoimmune disease screening results were negative. So the patient was diagnosed with eosinophilic pneumonia and, oh my gosh, started on prednisolone, started on steroids. She felt a little better. But then three weeks later, she was admitted to a tertiary hospital with recurrent fever persistent cough, and CT scans revealed uh, persistent liver, spleen lesions, migratory pulmonary opacities. She goes on to develop neurological symptoms over three months, gets an MRI of her brain where they see a 13 by 10 millimeter peripherally enhancing right frontal lobe lesion, undergoes an open biopsy, and they notice a string-like structure within the lesion, which when removed was a live and motile helminth. All right. As they say, it was identified on the basis of its distinctive red color, three active ascaridoid-like lips, presence of a cecum, and absence of a fully developed reproductive system. And they have some, well, pictures worth looking at. The patient received a couple days of ivermectin, four weeks of albendazole, was given a weaning course of dexamethasone over 10 weeks, while all other immunosuppression was discontinued. Six months after surgery, um, they were able to stop the dexamethasone. Three months after ceasing the dexamethasone, um, the neuropsychiatric symptoms had improved, but uh, they did persist. And I think we're going to wrap it up right there. Um, that brings us to the end of this podcast, and what an end. As always, the references for this show are available at microbe.tv, the home of our multimedia empire. You can find the Infectious Disease podcast at Apple Podcasts, microbe.tv forward slash podcast. We love to get your questions, comments, and paper suggestions, so continue to send those to podcast at microbe.tv. If you like what we do, please support us uh, and support all the science shows at Microbe TV. So go to www.microbe.tv forward slash contribute or go to Parasites Without Borders at www.parasiteswithoutborders.com and click on the donate button. I'm Daniel Griffin. You can find me at parasiteswithoutborders.com on Twitter or X at Daniel Griffin MD, um, as well as on the other podcast this week in parasitism and this week in virology clinical updates. And as always, thank you for this most interesting consultation and allowing us to participate in the care of this most difficult and challenging case. We shall continue to follow along with you. Thank you and dictation and goodbye. Thanks for listening. We'll be back in two weeks. Another podcast is infectious. Infectious.